Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is October, which means it's uh, National Book Month. And uh, the National Center for Disability, Equity, and Intersectionality is celebrating by um, focusing and highlighting disabled authors. And so uh, we are here today with Kevin Barry, um, and we couldn't be more excited about this discussion with you. And uh, so welcome. And um, Tell us, oh, before I go any further, I'm so sorry, I forgot to give an image description. I have a uh, blondish brown hair. I'm wearing a navy top, earrings, and uh, glasses today, but just a white background. Uh, Tracy, and then we'll go to Kevin. Um, I have, uh, my hair's a bit longer than sh uh, shoulder length, and it's uh, sort of wavy, curly, and it's half up, half down. And I'm wearing a black top and um, earrings that, you, that are tiny, tiny earrings. <laughs> um, I'm 58. My hair is probably best described as messed up um, and graying, <laughs> graying all over. Um, and I'm wearing a blue and white striped top. Um, and that's that's me. That's great. Thank you so much. And you're joining us from New Zealand, which is super exciting. What what is life like in New Zealand? Um, because it's it's pretty laid back. Um, we're you know we've got an election coming up in three days, which is exciting. It's um early spring, and it's a lovely spring day here. It's midday, um, and yeah, it's a uh, it's a nice place to live. Nice. All right, well, I'll uh, hand it over to Tracy uh, to start us off on our discussion. Okay, um, so my first question is, what is one piece of, well, first of all, I have to say I really enjoyed your book because I found it Thank entertaining. You. And I know you wrote it years ago, but um, I found it entertaining and was laughing and entertained throughout the whole book. And so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is one piece of advice that you would give to aspiring disabled writers? Um, I think the the main advice is to never give up. I mean, many people do give up when they start writing. I, I don't know what the percentage is, but a, a lot of people want to write a book. Very few actually start and not many finish. Um it's a, a long, challenging journey, especially if you're going to draw from your own experience. And so you're writing about something that is perhaps triggering for you. Um, then, yeah, it can get quite quite hard to face some, you know, perhaps some difficult emotions, um, just as well as the, the hard slog of finding time to write. Um, and then even when you're finished writing, if you can finish a first draft, you've got to go through it again and again. So you need real commitment. Um, but yeah, the key thing is just to never give up, just keep, keep going and to seek help from other writers, writers around you who understand that there's other people um, who are not writers, don't really understand you know, the process that you're going through get a book finished what inspired you to keep writing what were the things that inspired you um I'd written books before um they they weren't as good they're now out of print um but I I just love stories you know and for stem and for kaleidoscope for stem especially I felt like this is my story I can tell a story from my own experience and I felt like I just had to do it because there, there are just not many books out there um, like that. And, and you know, I felt like I really wanted to, to put down something where the characters are not, you know, stereotypes like you see in movies or on TV. Um, they're more authentic. And I could, I could write that with that authenticity. Um, and I just love writing. So I've, I've written many books since, different genres. Um, yeah, it's it's something, I mean, if you're 
introverted, if you have um, autism or whatever, it's something you can just do by yourself quietly. Um, takes up a lot of time. You can pour a lot of passion and energy into it. And yeah, it's, it's captivating. Great. Um, okay, so since you mentioned it, um, we recognize this book was published in 2013, um, and you mentioned autism, and at the time, the term Asperger's was used, and it's no longer used here um, in the United States. Is it still a term that's used in New Zealand? No, no. When it was dropped um, from the DSM, it was dropped in New Zealand as well, so it's all um, generally ASD is what is, is used now, autism spectrum disorder. Um, or some people just say autism. Um, so Asperger's, Asperger's, you do not hear very much now. Um, at the time when it was dropped, I was um, still fairly new to understanding you know, my diagnosis. I was only a few years um, before. And I'd been um, in some support groups, a couple of support groups uh, with other people. Um, and they were quite miffed actually that the term Asperger's was disappearing because they, they felt like, you know, they felt more um, that it suited them more than just a broad term that covered everything. Um, yeah, I felt much the same actually, I still do. Um, yeah, it was hard to explain. I think, I think it was wrong to remove that term, but, um, yeah, when I was a, a kid, I mean, Asperger's had never been diagnosed in, in New Zealand, so it was, you know, it wasn't really understood at all until much later. Um, probably there weren't many clinicians, you know, with any experience of that, um, I didn't know anything about it until my son Nicholas was diagnosed with autism, and really that was the like the first, you know, I'd ever really considered um, that. And and then I went to um, to read up on that, and I read as much as I could. You know, I read several books, um, and you know, I recognised a lot of traits, and you know things that applied to me. So I went for my own diagnosis, private diagnosis. Um, and it actually really helped. It helped me understand why I'd always felt different, especially as a child, and why when I was, you know, growing up, everyone seemed to be going in a different direction to me. Like high school differences were greater, university I just felt completely alien to me. You know, everyone else was, or everyone I could, you know, had any contact with, it was very different. Um, so, yeah, it's quite hard going. And other people I've talked to um, have similar stories, you know, not knowing and not having any support or understanding um, when you're young about, about this. Um, about this neurodiversity, it's really hard, you know. I think my son, because I know and understand things, he also has ADHD, which um, adds another layer of complexity. Um, for him, I, I know and understand that, so I'm more able to, you know, look after him and explain things in a different way and and so on, and understand what he um, means and what he is trying to do, and so on. But he he rejects the diagnosis. He um, he does not want to be seen as being different, to feel different. Although he knows he is different, he's known that from from when he was four. You know, he was different from every other child. You know, he couldn't ride a tricycle, but he could read. You know. And the kids around him were all playing together and he was, you know, playing on his own. 
And um, yeah, but if if I say to anyone, you know, he has autism, then he he sometimes reacts violently. He hits me, um, or he hits his stepmother. Um, so for him, it's it's quite a hard thing to to manage to understand. Um, in New Zealand, I think nowadays there's really good um, support from schools, um, and his the schools that he's been to have been really good at at understanding and um, communicating with him, and you know sometimes rearranging a lot of things around, you know, changing their processes for him, but. Even with that, um, he was failed by the school system. You know, he got through to the last year of school. Um, he, he just can't manage the final exams. So although he'd passed up until the final year, he fell just short in the final year um, because he, he, he can't really manage, you know, to sit in the final exams and, and concentrate and um actually follow the instructions you know he, he does his own thing he has his own view about what they should be asking and what he should answer so yeah it sounds quite... like for you the the diagnosis was like as an adult it was almost relieving like it was it was like yes. ah, like this explains so much of my life and I absolutely yes. I've had similar experience with that of like oh like that's why I do this or that or whatever yeah. and it is relieving and um but it sounds like for your son it's been a different experience and it's almost like he's responding to the mm. stigma and the ableism that he's experiencing and he's like you know I don't want to I don't want to deal with that um yes yeah. it is like i think yeah he, i mean i i can only imagine how invaluable it would be to him that he has you as a dad that understands like and that gets him in ways that probably other people don't i think anyone that has a disability and has any adult in their life that has that connection it's it really is invaluable it, it mm -hmm. there's no way to put, put words to how much that's worth uh, does he have other like friends i'd like to normalize that this is something that is just part of human diversity he's never had a friend mm. which is very sad for me it's heartbreaking um no he's never had a friend at all mm. yeah i can imagine very that. much on his own that is very hard and that but i think it means that you you mean the world to him and you're yes, yeah, like, yeah. That's, that's it. And, and I think that that's worth so much, and I think that's really, really neat. Yeah. But I think that you know, in today's world, I I want to validate his feelings of, of like the stigma and the ableism is real. Like it's it's not something that's, um, made up or you know, like he really no, experiences no, it's... that. And it's, as much as we know about autism, we also, you know, people still have a fear of it or a, like a, um, and I think that's true for a lot of disabilities, but especially so for um, for that, because it's so, uh, so much in the news, I think is. Yes, yeah. yes. and I mean, mental health, um, ADHD complicates things right. um, a lot as well, and that that is kind of poorly understood and you, know, you get some people um you know saying oh i'm very adhd about that whatever and whereas you know they're just using it as like a a, a cold catchphrase you know, not it's not a they're not taking it seriously they're not diagnosed or anything they're just you know especially school kids um yeah, that I've seen that happen quite a bit. Right, it's kind uh, of a colloquial like conversation instead of being an actual diagnosis. I think we've talked yes, a lot yes. of 
Leah and I, in our conversation of our center, I've talked a lot about that and um, minimizing things and ableism and the conversation around stigma. And I think that it's really important. One of the things that we're trying to do also by talking to authors with disabilities is to try to demonstrate like how important it is to show that it's mm. Yes. You can really, I mean, this is, I mean, I, it's amazing. I mean, you can do anything and it's really like, we're trying to fight against ableism. And that's like one of the big things that our center is doing. And yeah, I don't, I don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, I think it's difficult. Right. It takes a long time, doesn't it? Yeah, for right? people's attitudes to change. Right. Yeah. So how yeah. has your autism informed your writing? I, I could imagine. Yeah, I think you're getting a start on what's that um well for for those two books especially stem um yeah i wanted to write that because because of the stereotypes that existed at the time i mean the, the two that spring to mind you know is rain man you know the mm -hmm. the autistic man who's um you know who who has no contact with anyone but he can do this this amazing maths in his head, okay? And then the other one, which annoyed me greatly, was that guy from the Big Bang Theory, you know, popular mm -hmm. TV show. Um, and everyone sees that and thinks, oh, that's, you know, that's Asperger's, you know, and the Rain Man is, that's autism. Um, but, you know, it is a broad spectrum and people are not the same. They're not... The stereotype and it's also the developmental delay so someone with autism at, at 10 years old you know at 20 years old at 30 years old they have developed over that time and i felt like you know there were not many books yeah. around <laughs> there was what is it the um the curious instant of the dog in the night time yeah so that book okay that that was a good book um and there were a few others but not very many at all and you know i wanted to to write a story this person um with the voice of a young man who was really struggling like i did i really struggled um I had a breakdown at university my first year um just depression, all kinds of things is very difficult. And I wanted to write about that. And it would be different than, you know, the very brainy, very funny guy on TV. You know, it's really, there might be some people like that, but it's not really, um, I wouldn't say that's everyone. And, you know, a very small percentage of people perhaps um, and I wanted to convey the thinking, you know, the process of of thinking and the misunderstandings and, you know, had the literal nature of the, and the logical nature of the thinking of people with Asperger's autism. So that is how um, STEM came about. And it really was, I was pulling out, um, my own voice, my own experiences, in many cases. With the sequel, Kaleidoscope, that became a challenge because, um, well, in STEM, I wrote about depression, which I also have. Um, in Kaleidoscope, I was writing mostly about, uh, from the point of view of Chloe, who has um, Asperger's and bipolar disorder, now, I have bipolar disorder as well, which is uh, yeah, another diagnosis that came along quite late. Um, but her voice, you know, I wanted it to write something from her voice. Obviously, I didn't want it to be the same as Robert's voice in STEM. So, so this was quite a challenge, trying to come up with the voice of a, you know, 20-year-old woman with... Um, these conditions. I understood the conditions by that stage, 
but it took me some months until I actually worked out, you know, what what she would sound like to me in my mind, by which time I'd written like 20,000 words. And I had to go back and rewrite it. And in the voice that I had now created for her, um, what I thought was, you know, the authentic Chloe voice. So, yes, I mean, the, both of those books were quite very, very influenced by, you know, the conditions that I have. Um, the books that I've written since, they still influence them, um, even though I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I mean, I wrote a book recently um, in which a, uh, two characters met after several years, um, a woman and, and her aunt. And when they met, you know, I had them conversing and, and so on. And then I gave it to a friend to read and she said, well, why didn't they hug? Why didn't they hug when they met? And I thought, I never even thought of that. You know, I would just say, hi, you know, how are you? And just carry on as if I'd seen them yesterday, you know? Um, and she was pointing out, you know, most people would hug their relative, you know, after meeting them again for several years. So it's things like that that I miss in my my writing because it's not really something that I would do necessarily. It's but you know, neurotypical people um do act, you know, in a different way and think in a different way. So yeah, um, this you know kind of flaws in my writing that I rely on. I wouldn't think that's a flaw at all. If I yeah. if I were autistic, um, the ability to relate to that would be huge mm. because I I yeah. wouldn't relate to someone that said that they hugged, right? And so I yeah. I don't see it as a flaw at all. I see it as like the biggest um way to connect with with other neurodivergent people. Yes, yeah. I should I should write another book um, with, you know, a, an autistic character. I really should. Yeah. People have asked me to. Um, yeah, I've, I just haven't done it. I felt like I did so much in the first two books. I felt it was going to be hard to to do something and make it better. You know, I felt like I'd done, so I had a, like a fear of, you know, I'll produce something and it's not as good as, as the first one or two. So, well, yeah. it doesn't have to be better. There's no, you're not, you're only competing with yourself, but it doesn't have to be better. But I have to say, you know, I mean, the diagnosis of autism is um, just becoming a more and more prolific and, yes. um, and really large companies have found that um, neurodivergence is a huge benefit to them as employers, mm. having employers have um, these amazing qualities that they've been finding in their employees. And so yeah. sure people would really love to have characters they can relate yes. to, you know? So I mean, I th yeah, I think representation matters. And, and representation absolutely matters. Yeah. So it, you know, and that's, I, I mean, and also, I I think that everyone has different comfort levels of touching in general anyway. So mm -hmm. just because that one person said that they would hug a relative isn't necessarily indicative of everyone's relationship with their relative is another thing I would, I would say. So I think yes, that is a good point. Yeah. So, um, I, I yeah, go ahead. Um, I do have to say, though, that you bring even you bring things to the table I would have never thought of that are particularly humorous. And I mm. um, and so oh. <laughs> um, yes. one of the one of there are a lot of idioms in the beginning of the book um, going upstairs and down, I can't I, a lot of them I, I can't even remember every chapter starts with different um, phrases and different things and idioms and I have thought of that many times and my daughter has actually asked me those questions before and I've thought great point I don't know why yeah I yeah why. And I know English language is so full of interesting things 
that you know we we take for granted because we hear them all the time but when you first hear them especially i mean when i when i was a kid my mother would speak in cliches and idioms nearly all the time i mean it's just how she talked and and i'd be going i have no idea what you mean you know because <laughs> it just makes no sense you know yeah. I'd, I'd say something and and she would go too many cooks spoil the broth and I, I go i have no idea what you mean you know um and then then eventually i'd i'd hear you know uh, many hands make light work and then i'd try to reconcile those two things and they don't make sense together no, <laughs> So, so I love your own spin on it when you named the cat um in your the main character yes. of the book. Um and I was just wondering, I found it that was a very funny yeah. book to me was the name of your cat, the cat, Robert's cat in the book was sex. And I really enjoyed and appreciated the the humor behind it. And I, I know why that was there. It was really so that everyone could relate to it mm. um, for everyone else to be able to relate to this um, in a way. Yeah. And I thought it was a really great way to bring in everyone into this world. And I just really appreciated that. Um, mm. And it just created a brilliant backdrop, as I said, for the yeah, brain to, be able to show how the brain filters out information in different ways. Um, so I appreciate that. Is there a reason, like what inspired you to have this character? Um, it's, I guess largely it's just my quirky sense of humor. So, you know, that there is that, but I also realized um, that it, it gave away, you know, for, for Robert to show how when he is talking about the cat, you know, he's assuming other people know that he's talking about his cat. And of course they don't necessarily know, like you know, the policeman and so on. And they they get very confused. And he gets confused because he doesn't understand why they don't understand what he's talking about. So it's it's like a theory of mind thing in a way, um, which is, is something that is definitely the case for you know for people with autism up to a certain point until they develop that. I mean that can be quite late. Um, yeah, so I felt that was yeah. It's also a good contrast um, of of the characters and how they think. You know, different literal you know meanings and so on um it wasn't inspired by my own cats i do have two cats <laughs> um but i didn't name them they were both rescue cats so they already had names um so yeah but they're they're lovely cats that was my next question is what are your cats names <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah there's oscar and athena are my uh -huh. cats <laughs> Nice. Yeah, but they already had their name, so I, I couldn't I couldn't give them a name. <laughs> um <laughs> yes. So yeah, what else did I say? Yeah. I think partly I named, you know, I named the cat for entertainment value as well as um to create those situations uh where you know, there's misunderstandings and because that really does highlight um, the difference between Robert's way of thinking and the neurotypical way of thinking. Yeah. Leah, do you want to? Uh, um, yeah. I, I can. Um, so what, um, I guess one of my questions is uh, about publishing. So, what was your experiencing in publishing this book? Um, okay, I had I'd had some books published by a small publisher, really tiny publisher, before. And this book was with them too, but it was with them for about two years. And it was coming up to um, just a week before publication. And I had my second book, Kaleidoscope, ready as well and I realized well they're going to take two years to publish this one 
and I thought it was just too long, you know, other, I, I didn't want to wait that long and um, I wanted to have more control. So I pulled out my book from them, pulled them both out. Um, they weren't very happy about it. Um, and then I self-published, which took me only a few days. You know, you can do that on Amazon. Um, and then I did my, you know, did some marketing and so on. I bought some ads and things like that. Um, and I uh, arranged for a blog tour. So there's a company that um, contacts lots of bloggers who are interested in, you know, books of a certain kind. And, and then they, you know, leave reviews on their blogs. Um, and I, I, yeah, I got some great reviews from that. I was really, really pleased with that. Um, so, yeah, most of the time I've self-published since. Not always. I, I have a publisher in Wellington for um, children's books. And I had one book published through Kindle Press, through a kind of a competition. Um, but, yeah, as I enjoy self-publishing as well because, you know, you can, you can do everything. You know, I have to pay someone to do a cover for me, but, you know, I can... I can decide what that is. Whereas if you go through a publishing house, um, they'll tell you, you know, what they're going to do. They're going to, they'll tell you what the title is um, or what the cover is. So they might change quite a lot. Um, so, yeah. That's really cool to hear. Um, the, yeah. the, the experience of self-publishing. Um, we had another author tell us um, her experience and she was, uh, or maybe I read it somewhere, but anyway, they were saying how self-publishing is a real thing, and like it's, yes. it's become much more of an option now than it used to be. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> In the early days, um, people would look down on on those who self-published. Um, they'd say, "Well, you know, the books can't be any good if they're not accepted by, you know, one of the big five publishers." Um, but in fact. There are now very many authors um, who are outselling, you know, the, the top, you know, traditionally published authors, um, and the quality has gone up because of the the competition and you know the way that um, authors who self-publish tend to work together, you know, help each other out, and so they raise the quality of their writing. You know, and in some ways, um, if you're traditionally published, you know, you might write um, a couple of drafts and then send it off to the editor at the publishing house. And then, it, you know, it goes out according to their schedule. But if you're self-publishing, you can get lots of feedback from your friends, incorporate all of that, you know, um, and produce a quality product in the end you know yeah i i have to ask how many books do you have in total um there were three that i co-wrote with my ex-wife they are out of print they were all fantasy um there's dim and kaleidoscope which i self-published there's a dystopian book that was a kindle press there's um four uh, middle grade interactive fiction books that published by a um, publisher in Wellington and I've got two crime noir books that I wrote um, and a novella so they're all out they're all under my name wow. and I've just published a book under a pen name oh. last month um, which is paranormal women's fiction because um, I started reading some of those books. And I absolutely loved them. You know, I was laughing and I thought, this is really cool. And I thought I'd write one. So I've now written two. The next one comes out next week. Can I ask now, why you chose to do a pen name for those? Um, yes, it's because um, I'd used my own name for so many different kinds of books. You know, I felt like, and I took some advice from other people, you know, 
readers who are expecting something from me, like, you know, they're expecting a kid's book. And suddenly the next thing I'm publishing is a gritty crime noir serial killer book. You know, <laughs> they get a bit confused. Um, or, you know, I write, I write that uh, dystopian, you know, book set in the future. Um, and then the next thing is crime noir. And so it's just a hodgepodge of, of different genres. And, you know, I could even, like people suggest I could be losing readers because I keep changing what I was doing. Um, so, yeah, pretty much everyone said you should use a pen name for each different kind of book. It is quite common, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty common. I've heard of authors having several pen names before because they write different things. Yeah. I love it. I love the idea of it. It makes me uh, like it. It feels very undercover. Like uh, I mean, it is undercover, <laughs> but it's funny yes. to me. But I have always wondered why Dr. Seuss did it because his books, even the ones he wrote under a pen name, were very similar to the traditional Dr. P or Dr. Seuss books. So um, yeah, it's interesting to hear why people choose to do it and why they choose not to. Well, even, you know, very top authors, um, Nora Roberts, who sold, I don't know, hundreds of millions of books. She she writes under, um, as J.D. Robb, she writes crime. So, oh. yeah, so, you know, and she's pretty clever at picking that that pen name because if you look on the bookcase, bookshelf in a, in a bookshop, J.D. Robb and Nora Roberts are pretty much next to each other. Next to each other, yeah. <laughs> that's smart. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so that's, that's one example. But, I mean, there are many, many people who use different pen names for, for different things. Just so that, you know, the next time a book, next time they publish a book, um, their readers will know it's going to be the same kind of thing that they're used to. That makes sense. Not yeah, not something that's completely different that, you know, they might then get disappointed with because it's not what they were expecting. Yeah. It's funny how people get so um, attached to... I am. To I have authors that I am, you know, yeah. I go to them for like, you know, beach reads or I go to them for certain things and I would be probably <laughs> done to yeah. all of a sudden read a horror but uh, yes. not um, when I'm looking for a beach read so you know <laughs> yeah yeah I I like to read all kinds of things but you know I would expect if I pick up an author's book that it's it's like what I've read before from them you know apparently most people just want much the same you know as before they just want the same kind of experience that they've had from that author you know, they know they'll be taken on the same kind of journey, you know, whether it's it's like a a nice cozy mystery or whether it's, you know, a, a, a slow burn romance or whether it's a very gritty crime novel or whatever, you know, different story, but same kind of experience is what they want. And um, yeah, so that's the idea behind pen names. All right. <laughs> What's the kind of criticism you've gotten from, um, like, uh, not specific criticism, but I'm just curious if people have come to you and said things like, um, I wish you would have ended it like this, or I really wanted this character to do this, or have you oh. gotten things like that? Yes. Um, when I published with uh, Kindle Press, my dystopian book, um, the editor there told me I'd left... You know, I left something unfinished, which I'd done deliberately. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. the main character, um, you know, two two guys were interested in her. And I left it like that as a bit of a mystery. And she said that I had to resolve that. So I had to write an epilogue. So I wrote an epilogue, even though I wasn't very happy about it. And then, you know, people were saying, well, oh, the epilogue's not very good, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I should have just left it. But right, and, can't and, make um, people happy, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, with Stim and Kaleidoscope, I've actually had some 
great feedback, especially for STEM, you know. And that's the nicest thing is um, people saying, you know, I've never read a book like this. Um, now suddenly I understand myself or I understand my, you know, my husband or my my child. Um, I even had someone say that to me last week, you know, awesome. and Facebook, they said, thanks for writing these books. Uh, they help me understand myself better. And is it, that's actually the the best thing for mm -hmm. me because that's, that's really why I wanted to write it, you know, so people would understand and, and see things. I didn't realize, you know, it would help many people, you know, so many people is not just people on the autism spectrum, but people who aren't, who know someone who is, and they go, ah, now I know why that person, you know, says these things or, or whatever. And it's, yeah, it's very satisfying. Um, yeah. That's awesome. So that's the kind of feedback I love to have. Absolutely. That's invaluable feedback. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't always get, you know, good feedback. Sometimes, well, I've never had bad feedback from those books, I don't think. Um, on one or two other books, you get someone saying, I didn't like this book. I didn't finish it. It's terrible. And and that actually makes me feel so so bad. Right. You know, I was reading for my dystopian book. Someone said this book's too awful to finish. And I, one star, and I thought this is so devastating. And I couldn't write anything for months after that. And you know, people would say to me, "Well, look, it's just one person." who didn't finish the book and they probably didn't get it. They probably didn't understand the themes and so on. Um, so, yeah, I've learned not to read too many reviews now and to try and ignore anything that's negative. I mean, mostly they're very positive, but I mean, every author gets bad reviews. I mean, Stephen King and so on, you probably look up his books and you have thousands and thousands of reviews. Mm. Still going to be quite a few people who say this book was awful, you know, mm -hmm. just because they didn't like it for some reason. Right. You know? But you're not the first author that's told us um, they don't read reviews. And, and even people that right. come to them and say, I read a review that said and she, that other people have said, stop. Don't don't tell me I don't need to know you good bad whatever like just yes. stop there because it's it's not it's not worth it. Yeah, I I used to read them all the time. I used to read every one, and you know it's great having a nice review. It really is. Um, but then I just took it so personally when I I got a bad review, you know. And for all I know, I mean that person was having a bad day. They might have had a fight with their wife or husband and we just got fired from work or the no. dog got run over or whatever right. you know yeah. and who knows or perhaps they just didn't like it because they they don't usually read books like that yeah uh, that's not their genre it might just not be their genre yeah. book. I mean yes exactly <laughs> and there's no way for me to know no I you know, just taking it at face value what they said and thinking oh, that means that I'm a terrible writer because this, this one person didn't like my book, you know? And, um, yeah, it's a, but it's I a have dangerous... To say, like, of course you take it personal. Like, it's a piece yeah. of you that you've put out into the world. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's the vulnerable and piece effort into it. Yeah, know? like, yes. that, that's, yes. like, that is the art. Tear. Yeah, that's yeah. the art of it, right? Is it's a piece of you and you're giving it out and then um, someone... Yeah has to say something yeah it it also happens with you know a draft like if I write a, a book and it's my first draft and maybe I, I do some editing and then I send it off to another author a friend um to give some comments you know like does this story hold together are the characters you know seem consistent to you and you know sometimes you know, I'd get back from my, my friend, one of my friends that'd say, 
yeah, there's a few flaws here and they write, you know, a couple of pages of stuff. And then it's like I'm lying down with a migraine <laughs> the rest of the day while I process this. Um, and then I finally realize, okay, yes, they've made some good points. I need to go back and edit, you know. Um, but I think that's the process for nearly every writer, you know. Every writer seems to get, at least um, indie authors, the self-published authors, you know, get help from from others. They get feedback. Um, I don't know anyone who doesn't. And yeah, of course, that's you, you want you want honest feedback. There's no point giving your manuscript that you've worked on for six months to you know to your mother or or your best friend, and they say this is great. When, when actually, you know, that's not helpful. No, <laughs> what, right. you, what you need is another writer to go through and then and and go. Well, okay, I don't understand why this happened. You need to explain it, or well, this part's too slow, or or whatever. And that's really useful feedback. And you know, you can use that. Well, it might be a bit hard to to take at the time. You know. Um, yeah, it's actually quite helpful. Right. Well, we have to ask what what's next for you. What's your next project? Do you have something lined up? Um, it's these paranormal women's fiction books. So I've written two, and then I got really stuck trying to start a third one. I got a plot, and I worked out a plot over some weeks, and I thought. Yeah, I've got this, but I just could not start it. So um, a few days ago, I talked to a friend of mine um, from down south. We had a Facebook chat, and you know, I gave her my plot outline, and she analysed it, and she came up with some good suggestions, um, which helped explain why I didn't feel like I could start. She said it's probably a subconscious thing, but I felt like there's not enough emotional depth in the story. There's not enough emotional stakes. And so she made some suggestions. And now I'm actually excited about writing it. So I can, I'm going to start writing that um, in the next couple of days. And this is, you know, this is after probably four months of being absolutely stuck. So... I mean, you've heard of the term writer's block, you know, and yeah. Oh, um, process, that, right? Yeah, that that affects me. Um, but it's, it's always that there's something wrong with the story, you know, something is wrong and that's why I'm not writing. Um, other people, and I've heard, you know, some people say, well, you know, you you just need to be, inspired to write but you make sure you're inspired at 9 a.m every morning you know <laughs> and and you know you just sit down at the keyboard and and you write but um yeah i find if i'm if there's something not quite right with the story in my mind i may not work it out but it's where it's very helpful to talk to someone else about it and you know yeah, so that's the next thing for me. Hopefully writing um, a couple more of those books. Um, I'm probably going to go back to crime noir as well. And I have been thinking for some time about writing a book about, um, well, the title would be ASD Dad, ASD Son. So, and it would be, it would be pretty hard to write, actually. It would be writing, I'd be writing about my experience as a child and my son's experience as a child and, and for me raising him. And um, I haven't decided yet whether I want to try and do that. Um, I think I think it'll be quite an emotional drain, you know, to, to do that. It'll be quite triggering. Um, which, you know, if it is which I'm sure it would be, 
it is probably something that other people would find very useful and interesting to read. Uh, if I if I didn't pour you know all of the emotion and and so on into it, then it it wouldn't be that interesting to read, would it? You know. So um, I'm still thinking about whether I I can do it. You know, um, whether I should do it. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's definitely something that I'm thinking about. Yeah. Amazing. It's not, not happening immediately though. <laughs> right? And I think that's but, okay for it to be on the back burner for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. It's a back burner type of thing. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been such an interesting and fascinating um, conversation you're welcome. about your process and yeah, learning amazing. more. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for interviewing me. Yeah, thank you so much.